for me, uh, in many ways, an uh, emotional <laughs> moment in, at, uh, at Columbia. Also, the, the day that this book has come out, and I've seen it now for the first time. You can buy it over there after the session for twenty dollars. <laughs> um, and, and also, I'm I'm uh, I'm keen on what I'm going to hear. It will certainly improve my education. And uh, in these matters, there's no end to what you what you can learn. What I think I will do is, <coughs> I will point out what I believe uh, are the main uh, characteristics of this book. Uh, when I wrote the book, this was almost two years ago. And these days, the world is changing so fast that uh, one wishes one, uh, each book that you write should remain a virtual book uh, that you update uh, all, all the time. So nobody can say, but. Uh, this and this happened that you didn't uh, expect or that you didn't think would happen. Still, I, if I had to characterize the book uh, as an outsider, I would begin by saying that uh, it considers the crisis of 2008, uh, an event that still uh, uh, is going on, uh, as part of a, a crisis history that began in the 1970s. Um, I begin with this sequence. Uh, begins with the inflation of the 1970s, uh, the rise in public debt in the 1980s, uh, and the, in the rise in private debt, household debt, uh, uh, in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Having lived through this entire period, uh, when I looked at 2008, I was able to remember the work of John Goldthorpe and Fred Hirsch on the, uh, on the inflation crisis in the 1970s, and their convincing explanation of inflation as the uh, monetary expression of a deep distributional conflict uh, over, uh, uh, over the, uh, the share of the sharing of the um, uh, results uh, of uh, an economy organized uh, according to the principle of capital uh, accumulation. Um, so beginning to uh, apply this uh, general perspective to, uh, to the uh, 2008 crisis, I began to see a sequence, as I said, from inflation to public debt. And indeed, if you, if you take any country that you want to take uh, and plot uh, inflation rates, uh, uh, rates of public, uh, public debt, uh, the uh, increase of household debt, you see that they, uh, they work like communicating pipes, so to speak, uh, uh, as inflation and public debt increases, as public debt begins to be consolidated first the first time in the 1990s. Uh, the, uh, the phenomenon that Colin Crouch had called privatized, uh, privatized Keynesianism begins to kick in, at least in uh, a, a large number of countries. Germany is an exception for reasons that I can, I can explain. So after the, then, uh, so this is the first uh, part, a longitudinal perspective, uh, a, a trend, not an event, an underlying crisis that manifests itself in changing ways. Uh, the transition from one manifestation to the other is usually uh, can usually be described as the end of a fix to the underlying problem and the invention of another new fix, which however lasts only for a limited period of time. After 2008, uh, the, the era of quantitative easing and uh, permanent attempts uh, sort of to re re return to through what is called tapering central uh, banks as governments of last resort. That would be sort of my uh, uh, phase number four. As a general methodological principle, uh, what I learned when I did this was it is extremely productive to look at trajectories rather than events. And, and that uh, uh, and, and there I, I became very sort of uh, sympathetic to what, uh, what historians do, although I'm too old to, uh, to be trained. <laughs> I have to stick to my own gun. Uh, second point, uh, 
this is a crisis history of capitalism, not of varieties of capitalism. When I plotted my curves for the major countries that were affected by this segment, the similarities were clearly more important than the differences. There was a common political economic logic underlying this. And, and, and it, it was not just a common internal logic, but also uh, an increasing interdependence through industrial and in particular financial globalization during this period. So in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the inflation crisis in the 1970s, America, uh, Britain had enormous inflation rates compared to a country like Germany. But the 2008 crisis was sort of uh, immediately spread. The, the housing market in the United States collapsed, and then two or three days later, uh, the German banks had to be rescued. That, that to me was a very impressive uh, uh, characteristic of how things had become linked to each other. Third point. What the book tries to do is what one could characterize as a political economy approach. The crisis segments as a result not of uh, te technical economic mismanagement, but of a complex collective struggle between different economic interests that I characterize as capital and labor uh, within a state uh, that uh, or reflected in the politics of states over the distribution of the results of capitalist production. Behind the struggle, uh, the end of post-war growth, uh, translated into political economy terms, a growing inability of capitalist political economies as social and economic systems to lift up to what I characterize as the promises of uh, of the post-war compromise on which modern capitalism was founded. Uh, and in the book, I try, to, uh, uh, I try to trace the effects of this uh, on government and the state and how it is reflected. Uh, here, what the mainstream perceives as increasing ungovernability is being discussed in terms of not frivolous demands by the working class as in public choice, but as a gradual retreat of the management of capitalist economies from their foundational post-war promises, mixed economy, welfare state, uh, underlying the sequential dysfunctions of public policy during this period. You could say in, in a, a, a traditional sociological uh, language like uh, Lockwood, uh, a clash between social integration and system integration, or between, in Polanyan terms, human society and market expansion. Uh, a, a tension that uh, one can show was sort of uh, uh, mediated uh, in, in the so-called glorious uh, 30 years after the war, and then was no longer possible to, to keep together. I, I saw with great interest the work of Thomas Piketty, who shows us that uh, we're now sort of back in the world of capitalist normality, whereas in those 30 years we were in exceptional condition. And, and I think that's a spirit that, uh, that you find in the book uh, very much uh, represented. In, in the book, I'm simplifying the notion of the class structure by distinguishing between a uh, uh, wage-dependent and a profit-dependent class, uh, recognizing uh, overlaps between the two. Uh, but it's a short book, and the idea was not to, uh, to write a new class theory, but, but the, uh, the, 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 the tradition of political economy is to distinguish interests in terms of the kind of income uh, on which they uh, thrive and I think that uh, proved useful uh, in this case as well. Uh, in order to, to handle the economics of this uh, in a political economy framework, I, I went back to the Kaletskian uh, view of economic crises uh, as uh, uh, conflicts of interest between uh, uh, a class that decides on investment and the class that is dependent. 
Together with this goes what I concede is a simplified theory of political class interests, which I, which I uh, model in terms of a conflict between social justice and market justice, <coughs> or claims for social justice versus claims for market justice, where market justice basically means the claim that uh, distribution should be according to the marginal product, in other words, to the result of uh, the free uh, market, whereas social justice uh, is uh, uh, sort of pre uh, assumes a capacity and a need for government to correct the outcomes of markets in line with normative principles that are contested uh, in, a, in a democracy, but that have to be uh, in some way uh, in the direction uh, of adjusting the results of, of, of free markets to uh, uh, whatever you want, normative. Normative uh, principle. Um, fourth point: the crisis sequence in the book is narrated as a history of advancing neoliberalism, or uh, what I call the neoliberal revolution. That is a protracted, uh, gradual loss of political power and citizen privilege on the part of the wage-dependent working classes uh, moving political economies from uh, the social justice to the market justice pool. Uh, political power, uh, changing distribution, declining electoral participation in all these societies uh, especially at the lower end of, uh, of society, disappearance of trade unions, withering away of strikes, uh, the, the, uh, so dissolution of the traditional uh, collective bargaining regimes, uh, and uh, citizen privileges, as I call them. Throughout this OECD world, rising basic levels of unemployment, uh, precarious employment, privatization of social services, uh, rising inequality of incomes, um, decoupling uh, of wages from uh, productivity, increasingly less uh, progressive taxation, a declining tax take, uh, declining social mobility, all of these things. And the interesting thing is that uh, in, in America, one basically thinks that this happens only in the United States. Uh, if you include the European countries, uh, you, 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 with a sort of time lag, you see all these things also sort of, uh, unfolding. In political economic terms, I, uh, I describe the advance of neoliberalism as a movement from a Keynesian to a Hayekian economic order. Now, <coughs> that is uh, conceived in the book as a reversal, uh, I would say, by 180 degrees from the world, Keynesian world, in which redistribution from top to bottom figures as a productive force, as an engine of economic growth, to a world in which redistribution from bottom to top is necessary for economic growth, positive incentives at the top, negative incentives at the bottom, market justice. So uh, in, in this uh, so in these lectures uh, to develop a rough and ready uh, classification scheme, and I'm still very comfortable with this, the, the move from Keynesianism to Hayekianism is not just a move in the uh, technology of economic management, but uh, it goes much further uh, into uh, certain assumptions on the social structure and its relationship to economic uh, growth and, and productivity and the sources of now, in the book, I show that this uh, complex process uh, uh, coincides with a continuous shift in the main sites of distributional conflict. Uh, inflation in the 1970s was contested in labor markets. The public debt crisis was in the 1980s was related to electoral politics. The private debt uh, uh, crisis or solution to the public debt problem was capital markets. 
And the consolidation world of today uh, is one in which economic policy is negotiated between central banks and international organizations, summit agreements, uh, and, and the like, international conferences, an ever more remote uh, uh, setting from uh, everyday experience, uh, increasingly more abstract, uh, ever less accessible uh, to collective action or democratic collective action. In the 1970s, you could sort of see your employer, hate your employer, uh, uh, strike against your employer, and there was someone who could strike, who, who you could strike against. Today, uh, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you battle? Uh, the, the International Monetary Fund, the, the, or a European summit. That, that's impossible. The European Union sometimes tried to do this, and then they uh, then they take put people in buses, send them to Brussels, and, and inside the, the, the conference room you see the, the heads of government, and outside there are 2,000 people actually shouting something and nobody cares. So so that's also something that that I found uh, uh, both uh, very intriguing in this segment, and, and something that was uh, very much present in, uh, in different uh, in different settings. Then I go on to develop um, an hypothesis on the relationship between the emerging Hayekian uh, economic order and democracy as we know it. And, and there my uh, uh, sort of take on what one saw, in particular in Europe, in the last, let's say, five, six years, uh, or in the years after the crisis, but beginning also before the crisis, uh, that there is a place for democracy in this emerging neoliberal order only to the extent that it is not redistributed. In this sense, the book speaks of an ongoing separation between capitalism and democracy, parting company, divorce of what I call the post-war shotgun marriage between uh, 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 democracy and, and, and capital. That doesn't mean that the future is one in which, in which the secret police will, will arrest you if you write a uh, critical paper on the, on the, federal, uh, on the federal Reserve. Uh, but it is a uh, gradual process in which um, this phenomenon that Colin Couch has described as post-democracy uh, is emerging as a uh, uh, institutional system incapable of uh, correction of the outcomes of market mechanisms uh, as a source of, of inequality. So, so underlying this, uh, this thing is, uh, is this inequality engine of the market. And I'm, I'm glad that Piketty's book has come out because it sort of makes it easy for me to just refer to this. I, the, the book uh, the book assumes or argues, which with less uh, historical depth, that it is a mistake to assume that free markets result in an egalitarian distribution. Egalitarianism comes from intervention in this world, and and if from democratic intervention. If you if you separate the the course of the economy from politics, you get an increasing inequality. And uh, so post-democracy is economically sterilized democracy, biased toward uh, market justice as distinguished from social justice. Non-egalitarian post-democracy de-democratizes the capitalist economy, and I emphasize by political means. Uh, a, a book by, by Andrew Gamble uh, on Thatcherism comes to mind uh, with, the, with the great title, The Free Market and the Strong State. In order to have a free market, you need a strong state, a state that is capable of defending itself against the expectations of organized interests, as they are usually called in public choice language, which, uh, which is not the organized interests of uh, 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 Google or, uh, or Microsoft or uh, General Motors, but the organized interests of work. Um, Okay, uh, I have uh, five more minutes, yeah. and I will use them for my remaining uh, two points. <coughs> uh, along the crisis segment, 
and in parallel with the neoliberal revolution and the change of venue of the class conflict, these three developments that I've uh, commented on, I observed a fiscal crisis of the state. There I, uh, I go back to a literature of the early 1960s and 1970s where Marxist theoreticians like Jim O'Connor began to anticipate the possibility that uh, uh, states, democratic states, might end up in a fiscal crisis. Not, not, um, and and the, the interesting, if you read this literature, it is interesting that uh, both the, the public choice sort of right-wing uh, uh, version and, uh, and, and the neo-Marxists so it agreed on the possibility that this was, or on, on, on the fact that this was a possibility, but they didn't see uh, the, the particular uh, trajectory that this was going to take. What I do in the book, I, in the book I, I'm sort of wedded to three step developments. And, and what I do there is I start with Schumpeter's uh, analysis of the 1920s of the tax state and show how in the course of uh, financialization, the tech state became able to turn into a debt state uh, to an extent that Schumpeter was unable to anticipate. His, his uh, contemporaries also thought that, that there was a, uh, that there might be a limit to the capacity of the state to extract taxes from uh, a private capitalist uh, uh, society plus economy, and that this would result uh, in uh, a systemic crisis. But what they didn't see was to, uh, to the large extent to which it was possible uh, to borrow. Yeah. And, and in my book I show how, um, <coughs> beginning in the 1970s, in all these countries, uh, uh, debt is sort of almost continuously rising uh, up to the present time, and now even more after the after 2008. The, the interesting thing about public debt is not that uh, Keynes has suggested that in economic uh, emergencies uh, the government might indebt itself. The interesting thing about uh, debt as we saw it after the 1970s is, is its continuous increase. In, in Germany in the 19, late 1970s we had a national debate about uh, uh, limits of of, uh, of public debt when debt was about 35% uh, of the gross domestic product. Now it is 80%. And, and and the interesting thing is, regardless of who governed, it went all the way up. Uh, and my, one of my sort of strong arguments in the book, I think, is that if you see these long-term trends, uh, it becomes less easy than if you handle the situation as an uh, as an event, becomes less easy to suggest remedies that would uh, end this if, if you see that it is such an uh, ingrained long term uh, tendency. So, my tripartite uh, um, uh, toolkit here is uh, the, the tax state, the debt state, and the consolidation state, or the austerity state. Again, uh, three steps. Long increase in public debt, accompanied by a, an equally uh, uh, long increase in, in private debt, just to give you a sense of what this is like in the United States. If you add uh, the debt of the state, of private households, of uh, the financial sector, and the, uh, uh, the uh, industrial uh, sector, in, in 1970, this amounted to four point five times the gross domestic product. Now it basically amounts to nine times the gross domestic product. And and if you if you add these things, you see that the curve is absolutely even. It's a linear, just going up all the time. Yeah. It's very interesting. I'm I'm uh, I'm very eager to learn what, what that means. Uh, I, my feeling is it can't continue forever. Uh, at the same time, there are people who uh, who don't. So I, I, it, it would be interesting to learn something. Uh, today, consolidation, and that's very interesting. In, in phase four, if you now look at Europe, something that that wasn't so clear to me when I wrote the book, consolidation is sort of temporarily put off or uh, slowed down under electoral pressure and legitimacy problems of central banks as political institutions. The banks are very keen on not uh, 
uh, on the avoiding to be seen as agents of a particular class. And, and of course, the, uh, the neoliberal uh, reforms, quote unquote, that they, that they want as a condition of their continuing to finance these economies uh, are uh, uh, very much perceived by the electorate as something that is directed towards them. Yes, and then let me uh, end by saying that the eighth point, and then I'll, uh, I'll finish. That there's a debate, a discussion here about the relationship of the debt state and democracy, the Schuldenstaat uh, and democracy. And there I suggest these, this uh, analytical schema uh, in a polemic way um, directed against uh, a conventional uh, theory of democracy that today's states have two constituencies, not just one, not just the people of the state, in German, uh, the, the difficult to translate the Staatsvolk, but they also have a second constituency, the Marktvolk. The, the, the people of the market. And these have different views on how uh, governments are supposed to function. They make different claims. They have different modes of claim making, so to speak. In the book, uh, uh, there is a, a little table that, uh, that compares the two. So the, the Staatsvolk is organized at national level, the Marktvolk today at international level. The one are citizens, the others are investors. The former have civil rights, the other have commercial uh, have claims in commercial rights. The former are voters, the others are creditors. Uh, the the, the, the Staatsvolk expresses its will occasionally through elections, periodic elections, whereas the Marktvolk is capable of expressing its views continually in auctions of, uh, uh, of, of, of government debt, and it expresses this quantitatively in terms of interest rates, rather than qualitatively in terms of we are not so sure whether this government. So, so there is public opinion on the one side and interest rates on the other side. Loyalty of citizens on the one side and confidence in, in the market on the other side. And, and the contrast between a government devoted to public services on the one hand and to debt service on the other hand. I claim that if you want to understand contemporary democracies, especially in Europe today, America is an exception in the sense that America can indebt itself uh, uh, indefinitely because they are printing the money that, that <laughs> with which they can repay their, their debt. But this is not something that Europeans can. So, so that governments today have to have to play between to mediate between these two constituencies. And uh, uh, if you just as a theory of democracy, you just look at the one constituency and forget the other one. You fail to understand what is happening in these democracies, what Angela Merkel calls market conforming democracy. That, that's, uh, that's exactly what, what this is about. So I, I, I finish here. I hope you, you have a general uh, impression of, of what the book <laughs> is about. And now I'm, I'm willing to hear, uh, and I'm eager to hear where it could be improved. <laughs> Thank you, Wolfgang. It's a, it's a privilege to be able to engage Wolfgang in, in direct discussion. A um, uh, simple thing to say is it's a great book. You should go buy it uh, and read it. Um, uh, the first chapter is a, is a fantastic manifesto for historical sociology, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's really fascinating. Uh, Wolfgang hasn't even given you uh, the, the chapter on the euro at the end, which is, in fact, uh, the chapter with which Habermas took such vigorous issue uh, last year, because that's really where the implications of some of Wolfgang's argument uh, comes through in his strong uh, argument for a disassembling of the euro, a multi-speed, multi-tiered euro system. And that's maybe something we'll come on to in discussion. Maybe the other discussants are going to pick that up. That was certainly what Habermas focused in on. I want to focus my remarks on the central organizing idea of Strait's account, the idea of buying time and the way in which that concept can be used or not used to tell a historical story that goes from the inflation of the 1970s to public debt in the 1980s and private debt accumulation in the 1990s. This is a sequence that, as Wolfgang has said, fits the US quite well. It fits the empirical experience of others in varying degrees. But it's the underlying logic, the relationship of the suggestive language of borrowing time to the underlying political economy that I want to raise a series of questions about. And from that then derive a set of questions about Drake's history of the 1970s and there from there 
about his relationship to inflation. And this has urgency, I think, because deflation is the great risk to modern Europe. And I think on this point, uh, Wolfgang is far too cautious, nowhere near radical enough. So Wolfgang's central metaphor of buying time is suggestive. And in the German political lexicon, it forms an antithesis to Nachhaltigkeit, or sustainability. And in Strake's rendition, this buying of time is kind of like an illusion, an illusion that's doomed to break with an apocalyptic conclusion, a final ending, the moment when time catches up and must be repaid. And this is certainly suggestive, but at times I get the impression that uh, Wolfgang has become entangled in his own image. Because it's not in fact possible for a society viewed in isolation to draw resources that are not yet real from the future into the present, neither through borrowing, whether public or private, nor through inflation. Of course, it is possible to borrow from foreigners, but this implies a question that Strake never really poses. For every society buying time in this way, there must be others willing to sell it. Indeed, Germany itself, with its chronic export surplus and export of capital, is just such a country. So borrowing time cannot, in fact, be a logic of the entire system. For there to be any borrowing, there have to be, if not varieties of capitalism, which is a mode of analysis that Wolfgang is distancing himself from, at least differentiation within the system to generate the trade-offs between the borrowers and the lenders of time. But these differences within the system of international political economy receive little systematic treatment in the book, and I think that's an area where I'd really love to hear Wolfgang expand his argument. Beyond his Hayekian reading of the Eurozone, he offers us no international political economy, no account of the uneven and combined development of capitalism that would account for the huge macroeconomic imbalances of the present. It is, as you stress, a systemic account which stresses essentially similarity, but if that's the case, the whole issue of how one gets time borrowed is a little problematic, because it needs to come from an outside. There isn't anything like <coughs> Rubens and Rajan's accounts in, this book on, uh, in his book on fault lines which is all driven by precisely these asymmetries. And this omission is not incidental but central because it risks destabilizing the entire metaphor of borrowing time. Because if debts are not contracted with foreigners, if funds are borrowed internally, what this does is not to borrow time but to redistribute command of resources in the present among citizens within the same society. The society as a whole is not in any way relieved of any fundamental distributional issue. In the case of borrowing, this is matched by an offsetting promise of payment in the future. Inflation is more disorderly and chaotic, and rather than buying time, it alters the real terms of nominal contracts, both in the present and the future. If anything, it seems to me, by destabilizing long-term contracts, it tends to increase the pressure of time, to increase anxiety about the future. It also, therefore, is a stimulus to action and not merely to illusory action. And I do think at times, Wolfgang, you speak of inflation as though it was some sort of trick, a kind of false consciousness, a, a delusion, where there's nothing illusory about the real redistribution affected by those who aggressi aggressively assert their wage and price claims against those who don't. Nor is inflation, and nor was inflation in the 1970s, neutral with regard to growth, the overall size of the pie. Uh, the high inflation countries in the 1970s, like France, Italy, the UK, and the US, all, in fact, grew faster, and very substantially faster, than the two low inflation standouts, Germany and Switzerland, which had a horrible macroeconomic record in the 1970s. So far from an illusory shuffling of resources, inflation, in fact, generated real effects, and the inflating countries, on the whole, have a bigger pie to distribute. The real risk, in other words, of this guiding metaphor, it seems to me, is that it leads us to, to be too willing to accept conservative arguments about the inevitable end of inflation, the fact we need to move to phase two and then from there to phase three, to naturalize neoliberal deflationary campaigns of the early 1980s as an inescapable economic necessity that were, in fact, very hardcore politics. What inflation certainly is, is a stimulus to distributional conflict. The 1970s were one of the great eras of social struggle throughout the industrial world, and it's hard to avoid the impression that this makes Wolfgang a little uneasy, oddly. You're a great champion of a new era of democratic contestation. Given the narrowness of modern policy debate, you plead for an open language. It's an incredibly refreshing account. Against the blackmail of economic rationality, you invoke this great idea of a courageous refusal of responsibility. Why can't citizens freak out and panic like bankers? Bankers get taken care of when they freak out and panic. Why shouldn't citizens design the same, demand the same? You're in favor of street protest and political outrage. There's even a single moment where, by means of that image of the Flasterstein, you evoke the spirit of violent insurrection. But when it comes to the distributional battles unleashed by an inflation, there's 
a sense of kind of wanting to hold back. You say at one point that to unleash an inflation now would involve immense risks of political instability. And I would love to hear more about what is tied up for you in that, in that, in that word. Because on the face of it, you would have thought that an open democratic discourse about distributional questions would be exactly that, an open embrace of political risk. So what I'm really asking is why, when it comes to inflation, the language of your book is so cautious. An inflation embarked upon as a deliberate measure of policy might, you say, soon accelerate to a canter and then to a gallop. Central bankers would soon find themselves in the position of the sorcerer's apprentice. This would not be a return, you say, to the 1970s. It would be worse. And then you back this up with some sort of strong philosophy of history. One cannot dip twice into the same stream, you tell us. Though, of course, you yourself draw on Bretton Woods as precisely such an instance where from the history we might recover a better vision. Unlike in the 1970s, this would not be a trade union driven inflation. I, I, that's clear. But a banker's inflation, you say. A surge in prices will be dangerous because workers today are not organised to defend themselves. The losers will be pensioners and welfare recipients. And there's no doubt real weight in all these arguments. And inflation would certainly be a distributive struggle. But the question, I guess, is would it be harsher than the current deflationary repression? And even if it were a banker's inflation to start with, would it serve the purpose of alleviating the dead burden of debt that presses so ruinously on the public budgets of the rich countries? We basically need to burn off some of this debt overhang. And if your sphere of, of a magical process ran out of control were to prove true, would an accelerating inflation remain a banker's inflation for long? And this is really my final point. Are inflationary surges and levels of trade union organization not causally interconnected? Is the deflationary great moderation since the 1980s, which you naturalize as, as it were, stage two, not one of the key factors undermining collective labor market mobilization? Certainly across most of history, the phases of class struggle, which we now sort of nostalgically look back on as moments where the distribution was politicized, were all periods of inflation. Whether you're talking about the 1890s and the, the beginning of the 20th century, the aftermath of World War I, the post-World War II period, the 1970s. Certainly in the 60s and 70s, it was not simply that the trade unions drove inflation, but that inflation helped to stimulate collective organization and class conflict. Cutting out this feedback loop from price instability to social mobilization is presumably one of the unspoken conservative impetuses behind the deflationary consensus since the 1980s. So how we could actually get a revived inflation is, of course, the sort of trillion dollar question. And if it were set in motion, a revived politics of inflationary struggle under the sign, a uh, revived politics of distributional struggle under the sign of inflation would no doubt be risky and disorderly. But to reiterate, for advocates of a new era of democratic policymaking, that's hardly a reason to shy away from it. And history, in fact, offers us no attractive examples of debt reduction on the scale that we are facing without inflationary assistance by means of some sort of inflationary burnout. So I couldn't help feeling that despite this very brave break that I think you've made with certain the consensual norms of the German discussion, there is, in some sense, a way in which the decorous politics to which you subscribe remains rather more beholden to the era of the great moderation than, than, than is perhaps good for the force of your own argument. Well, obviously, this book is, a, is an important critique of, of contemporary capitalism, but not only of that, I think it also has this underlying theme of why did the people who thought about this in the late 60s, early 1970s got it so, get it, get it so wrong? Mm. Why didn't they see what would happen? And, and what are the things that they couldn't possibly have um, foreseen? Of course, one of the big questions I have, and it's an unfair question, but what are the things we might be missing today? Right? And so sort of looking at these big trajectories and the inevitability of things, aren't we making the same mistakes at some level that, that people in the late 1960s might have, might have made? So there are many, many things in the book that I agree with. <coughs> One, um, um, and, and some points of the agreement are um, the excesses of the contemporary financial capitalism, um, its inherent instability, um, the highly unequal distribution of gains and losses that are derived from the system, both within countries and across countries, um, maybe I would add here, at some point, it would also be useful to think a little bit, bit about the um, effects of the system on, on, on other countries in the, global, in, in the global environment. So we're focusing very much, of course, on, on Europe and the United States, but we're not thinking so much about other countries out there. Um, and then finally, um, the danger, especially, of unfettered global capitalism for the democratic project. So I, I, I think these are all really, really important themes. 
um, and, and I've enjoyed reading about them, and yet I've had sort of some really basic discomfort sometimes about how issues were framed and, and, and argued. And there are basically three points I want to I want to come and, and elaborate on this. One is um, what I would call paternalism of a particular type of the I think European left, um, that which made me cringe sometimes, and I will explain to you in a second why. Um, then another one which um, um, it really goes to the understanding of the nature of the beast, which is contemporary financial capitalism. Basically, um, do we really do fully justice um, to it by trying to give it the kind of agency that you're trying to give it by calling it, um, first of all, capital as having agency or, or calling it the marked folk. Um, and then finally, I want to say a few words about the democratic dilemma. So let me start with the paternalism. I think sort of there is there's something here where, where we have a very strong emphasis on the power relation in, in the old Marxian sense between employers and employees, um, but sort of at the neglect perhaps of other types of power relations that we may also think about, particularly in the immediate post war era, era. And I think that leads us also to some questions about you know what is freedom and what kind of freedom and how much of it can different members of society exercise, which have to be um, answered at some point. So let me just give you one quote um, um, that, um, that just to, to, get, to give you a sense why I'm saying this. Um, here, beginning in the 1970s, women throughout the Western world poured into labor markets, and what had been branded shortly before as historically obsolete wage slavery was now experienced as liberation from unpaid household drudgery. Despite the generally low pay, the popularity of female employment grew uninterruptedly in the following decades. In fact, women often became allies of the employers seeking labor market deregulation to allow outsiders to undercut male insiders. The growth in female employment was also closely bound up with simultaneous changes in the family structure, divorce rates increased, and marriage became less common as the children, while more children found themselves in unstable family relations, which further augmented the female labor supply. Women in particular <coughs> gain social prestige by combining kinder and carriere, children and career, if the career is that of a, even if the career is that of a supermarket cashier. Um, Adorno, far more pessimistic than the legitim legitimation theorist, would have seen in this as in the consumption ever of the uh, 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 as in the consumption of the past three to four decades, that very sense of well-being and alienation, the Wohlgefühl and Entfremdung, which he early on ex um, expected um, the cultural industry to be capable of providing. So we have, of course, important social changes during the same period where we have the degree of um, financialization and capital expansion that we're seeing. But of course, to some of us, at least, it also gives us exit options out of other power relations. So this is not only about prestige. It's also about having at least two masters um, that might exchange even internal family relationships and not only in destructive ways, but maybe also in ways that improves um, equality um, within, within the household. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is sort of when we think back to a system that might have worked better, it also seems that um, at some level we have to make a choice not only between um, sort of the new capitalist technocratic government that the European Central Bank might epitomize um, for us today, but on the other hand we don't really have a truly democratic govern governance, but also sort of a maybe for some but not necessarily for all more benign form of bureaucratic paternalism. So again, so the question I think at some level is, is to, to ask ourselves, who makes the decision about the kinds of freedoms that different people in society shall exercise? And I think it's a really difficult one, and one that we are coming back to when, when we're talking about democracy a little bit. <coughs> the second point I wanted to make was to say a little bit about the understanding of the nature of the beast. Uh, and for all of um, Wolfgang's critique of the capitalist system, I think financial capitalism might be even more, more difficult and maybe more, more beast-like <laughs> than it makes it to be, but maybe also at some um, paradoxical level, perhaps also um, possible to control. So I think obviously there is a big um, political economy story to be told here, and there's a lot to, to say about um, power relations. There are also, I think, very important, um, um, there's important evidence um, um, about the extent to which governments serve the finance industry. Um, and in some countries, almost by the entire government, you make the point about the United States and after the recent Supreme Court decision about party finance, um, <coughs> one has, has it, it's not to agree um, with that point. But I, I would argue there's more structure to this, and maybe for better and for worse. But I think it makes the system more enduring, more difficult to change, and more, par perhaps paradoxically, more prone to self-destruction. And that is that the system is really deeply institutionally and legally um, structured. Um, financial markets are complex systems that, are, that operate in a highly decentralized way by using enforceable legal commitments 
to run their course not only nationally in, or, but also de um, internationally. And if too many individual atomized actors will try to enforce simultaneously the claims that they might have against others, this system puts itself on an autopilot to self-destruction. And that system is incredibly difficult to control. So I think we, we can, of course, depict it as sort of the system of big banking industries that lobby together and then sort of try to buy up um, uh, the governments, but equally important, maybe even more important in our now market-based credit systems rather than bank-based um, credit systems is the atomization of those who act. So in that sense, to some extent, perhaps smart folk is a good um, 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 analogy because we're talking about um, decentralized um, agents. But at the same time, I think sort of the, um, the, sort of the um, mechanisms, as you suggest, also in this comparison the table, that the mark for, for, for exercises are incredibly difficult to control. They're built in contracts, they're built on contractual autonomy, um, and they are operating in a highly decentralized fashion and yet can bring the system, entire system down to collapse. And I think that also makes it a somewhat more complicated to really assess what the central banks are doing. Um, the ECB didn't necessarily entertain the quantitative easing um, uh, programs directly to make sure that the banks then buy um, sovereign governments, but they, many of course um, surely did, but it also tried to basically pump liquidity in the system where it was drying up in, in the markets precisely because too many um, actors were enforcing their claims at the very same time. And the self-destruction of such a system of course can wreak havoc. So this is not only political conspiracy theory, but I think this is sort of a, a, a real danger that puts the political actors, I think of whatever you know, um, stripe and uh, political leaning really into a bind, and I, I'd like to recognize um, that bind. It's self-created, self we've structured the system. Having said that, it doesn't mean that we can easily change it back, but it's also one that has features of um, complex interdependencies, but I think in this decentralized um, fashion that we have to understand. A related issue is that um, any um, credit-based financial system, of course, capitalism is based on credit-based financial system. The whole, whole idea is that we invest on returns that we get only in the future and equity would go, get us only so far so credit is part and parcel of the system but any credit um, based financial system is also inherently hierarchical some have a bigger <coughs> balance sheet than others and um, if you are in need of additional liquidity then this is where you turn so inevitably the system works itself back up to some central banks um, but that also suggests that actually some of the policy solutions that are suggested in the book might have very differential effects for different entities um, in the system. So for example, um, there is a section on the praise of devaluation. Basically the idea we have to get back to a system where we can flexibly control our currencies and then can devaluate. But that of course is, is dependent on, on two factors. Um, one is that we better haven't borrowed too much in a foreign currency. Um, and you also suggest that maybe sovereigns should just default. And yet, of course, not all, every, all countries have an equally easy um, opportunity to default, or the cost of that might be um, quite horrendous. And the other one, of course, is you have to have something to export. Um, I have, I mean, to do justice to the book, I have to say that, that you do suggest that sometimes if we give up the currencies, our economies, of course, restructure in such a way that we, we might be giving up this particular issue. But once we think about <coughs> devaluation, of course, we have to think about competitive devaluation and who thinks who might win or might lose in this particular game. So obviously within the European context in the 1970s, attempts were made to coordinate devaluation. That's basically what the snake <coughs> and the early systems did more or less um, successfully. But uncoordinated devaluation can be devastating. We know this, of course, um, from, from, from history. Um, so what you know, what I think the devaluation suggestion does is to um, make open the political decisions and create, basically make them political rather than depoliticize them. Um, um, the kind of um, things that we have to have to do, but at the same time, I think we should also take um, into account that there were very strong voices in the 1970s against um, flexible currencies in Europe. Um, Schmidt quite explicitly said at some point, you can't have a common agricultural policy with floating exchange rates. Now, I'm not sure the common agricultural policy is the one that we want to protect. <laughs> but other, other parts of social redistributive policies that you advocate and you suggest would take on quite a different form if we had floating exchange rates. So in a way, I think what we're really facing also in Europe was an attempt to have coordinated policies across different nations that are structurally and institutionally quite different. It's just one dilemma after the other. And I'm not sure that any of the policies in the post-war era has um, um, effectively resolved them. 
where I do uh, agree, I think, um, um, you know, if we could do it again, I'm not sure the euro would be the right um, step. I have often wondered why, after so many experience with, experiments with coordinating exchange rates, and if they always collapse, the move would then be to move towards the common currency rather than saying, well, let's step back, right? But after this move has been made, um, you know, I, I, sort of the, the, the question how to resolve this and how to find ways to get out of that again, I think is a difficult one, not only for financial reasons, but also for institutional and ultimately political reasons about the European project. Um, which I think brings me to the, to the final point um, about the, the d democratic dilemma. Um, and I think that the two points I'd like to raise here, um, one is how much cost sharing is feasible between as opposed to within states and, and, and under what conditions. And I think you raised this issue and, and your answer to that is to say that we are much more likely to share within states than we are sharing. Across states, um, these redistributions are, are much more um, complicated. At the same time, you know, we don't have to reify the, reify the nation state too much. Um, that kind of um, hom homogenization that came through citizenship and belonging to one nation is also of relatively recent origins. And in principle, I think um, one could st still hold on to a European project, which I think in the end we are trying to do also a little bit. Um, um, so na nations, of course, are not natural ph phenomena. And the other question, I think, is, 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 is democracy sustainable without it? Um, you know, especially democracies that are heterogeneous and more conflicted. Um, not all of them are as homogeneous as Germany um, under male supremacy in the 60s and 70s. Right? Um, so you, you suggest that the, towards the end of the, of the book, if capitalism of the consolidation state can no longer produce even the illusion of equitable growth, the time will come when the path of capitalism and democracy must part. And you suggest that, unfortunately, the more likely outcome is the Hayekian social dictatorship. Um, and probably, if we stay in the Eurozone as we currently are, this is largely true. I think there still is a little bit more wiggle room than you might suggest, and much of that is institutional. I think some form of cost sharing, for example, through a decent resolution regime, which of course is politically rejected right now, but a resolution with transnational re re resolution regimes for banks and other financial intermediaries would get us um, um, somewhere. Can, the, can there be democracy without capitalism is another way of asking the question which you put explicitly um, at the end of the book and you say it's politically unrealistic. But then I have to sort of read you again a quote that uh, made me pause, um, which says, for democracy and capitalism, the issue would be not to achieve social peace through economic growth, and certainly not social peace in the face of growing inequality but to improve the lot of those excluded from neoliberal growth, if necessary, at the expense of social peace and growth. But that, of course, might be a recipe for destroying democracy. First place, um, thank you, Josh, for being here in this group uh, in front of you. And, uh, you know, I was a student here at SIPA, and I worked for Lewis Edinger at that time, and it always has nice memories. I also took a class in mathematical economics from a guy named Papademos. Uh, shows up in the book uh, as well, so these technocratic circles are small. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's um, there was a line in the book, you struck in this charming beginning of this of this book, which I, I think is a, is a wonderful book. Uh, um, he cites the uh, Herdelin uh, comment, uh, which was hard to translate into English, you probably went back and forth on that, but it's kind of like, you know, where there's danger, you know, there, uh, what did I do? Growth, some sort of rescue, right? Um, so I think rescue, uh, you know, maybe is not quite right, but it's generally in that in that, uh, that direction. Um, and you, you know, Adorno, you said perhaps saw a dark side of history, and you also identified uh, in that um, as well. But you know, I guess I look at, I accept that. Uh, but I think of countries like Germany, for example, which had a you know a tough history and how well it's actually done in the past 50 years, uh, not only economically, but socially from that. I guess I tend to fall into the category of people who look at the, whatever, whatever lack of intellectual strength on the brighter side of these, uh, of these things. Um, and this opposition, therefore, this opposition of social justice and markets, which is basically what I want to talk about now, um, is not something I fully accept. Um, it's not that I don't, I don't see plenty of failings, but I don't generally accept that particular uh, issue. And, uh, and what I want to try to do in this, in this discussion is to pull you into something which I know you, 
you know, much better than uh, anyone I probably in this room I think, but certainly better than myself, is on the labor labor dimension, which you didn't talk a lot about in the book. Um, um, so I want to see if I can draw you into that particular uh, discussion, because you know, when I first met you, I think you had either just gone to Wisconsin, or you were going to transfer the German system to Wisconsin, and God knows we needed it probably more now than we did even back then. <laughs> or, um, and then I also know you worked with the Schroeder government, I, I believe, this on uh, the dance reforms, which I'm going to For a short time, then they kicked me out. They kicked you out. It's <laughs> <laughs> not, not an honest man. Um, so I want to talk a bit about these things um, as well. Um, and, and I also want to, you know, you know, say something in, in, in starting um, that whereas um, from a business school perspective, there's lots of things one can anticipate to be, to be said. Uh, and I certainly can say them. Um, probably the defense of, of finance is not one of, these, one of the things I want to live and die by. Um, um, but I do have a healthy respect for finance um, uh, and what it does. Uh, and I think that statement should be, should be made because you know, I certainly have taken great teachers in my time, but finance is intrinsically interesting unless it's, if it's magically engaging, if you wish. Um, but it does at times, you know, good things. And I do think in terms of the rescue, that there are ways we can look at finance too in that particular perspective, and that deserves some, something to talk about. Uh, I will say the one time I talked about finance early in my career was, as you know, I was in East Germany as an IRS exchange student. And they asked me to talk about bourgeois finance theory, <laughs> uh, which I love. And I had never been able to have a class at the business school called Bourgeois Finance Theory, but <laughs> I think that would be, be just, uh, just great. Um, you heard a lot of things. I knew, I knew Alex was, uh, uh, Adam was going to talk about, um, about inflation. Uh, I would make one quick thing. There's another way to inflate, to solve, to solve these issues besides inflation. The issue of debt is what Katharina mentioned. That's called repudiation of debt. Yep. Um, and that's something which, which probably could, should come back to in, the, in, this, uh, in this conversation because states do, inflation is a kind of sneaky repudiation and there's more overt ways to repudiate uh, uh, as well. But I guess I want to talk a bit about the issues of, um, of that, not of the great you know, first half of the book, which uh, I think is a great analysis, despite everything which we have you know, we can talk about. It's really a wonderful, interesting description of the, of the crisis and what we're about, but really of the, of the European perspective, uh, which, is, uh, which is quite, you know, quite critical. Um, so the euro is an awkward creation. We know it's, you know, and, we can, and I think Katharina spoke to that well. Uh, there was an article by Charles uh, Wiplos, uh, which I always liked back in the 90s when, when uh, George Soros, before he financed INET, was earning the money to finance uh, INET. Um, and uh, at that time he said, well, you know, with the unification, the one-to-one -one exchange, that seems so long ago that I'm thinking, of, what do you do? when well, you could inflate, uh, the Germans don't want to inflate, because that would kind of let prices find their, find their way. Um, you could devalue, but the Germans don't want to devalue uh, at that particular time. Or you could let uh, wages fall. Uh, if they don't fall, you'll let unemployment solve that particular issue. And there's a third one which prevailed a lot in the 90s, and the German was called, you know, the sick, what was the sick man of Europe was the particular expression. And it's important to remember that Germany was the first company, company country, you see that <laughs> to, uh, to, to have not met the 3% restriction on, on, their, uh, on their fiscal deficit uh, by the mass, mass uh, treaty. So Germany, mis <coughs> Germany misbehaved in that particular decade by those particular uh, definitions. Um, and there wasn't perhaps much to learn. Uh, Schroeder uh, made bold reforms and he lost his office. And in your book, you kind of I think you admire him for that particular statement. If I read that, for that particular act, at least being willing to lose office over reforms. Um, I surely do. I think that's, you know, I think it's rare that people, France, for example, would not look as well on that particular, particular issue. Um, but what I understand from the Herz reforms, uh, which came during this period of time, which I think is so critical, was this kind of, you know, liberalism for the periphery, but kind of a protection of the core institutions in the in the heart of the German labor market. Uh, I raise this because I know you, you, know, you, can, you can educate me on this better. Um, but you know, Verity, and this kind of echoes a little bit with what Katharina said, which is in the service center, this periphery, 
uh, has a, a 53 percent female uh, members in that, in that area, which is important to remember. It's one of the most vulnerable areas. And, and there was no minimum wage until until recently in the sector. It was purely a issue letting letting the employers set the wage, who takes it, and then if you can't live, the state will give you some sort of of, uh, of of transfer to allow you to be at some at some at some minimum. Uh, and at the core of it was the IG Metal uh, and engineering industries, a uh, great great part of it, of which 83 percent of its members are male. Which is important to think about because social justice is not just economics as you know all know. It has to do with the full package of what we mean by social social justice. So we created the dual economy and and it also the convenience of having uh, the Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary not too far away to do some of the lower uh, you know uh, high tech stuff. And lower wages was also very useful. And special contracts were written with unions to do that as well. Uh, so we had a creation of a dual labor market, almost in a priori sense, but much more formalized than we ever thought about, which was, uh, which was, which was important. Now there's an article by, by David Card, an amazing economist, uh, along with some other people. Um, you probably saw that in the German economy. And one of the things we know about the American economy as well is that what, what, mark, what market systems do is they, if in, in theory, what they do. Um, I don't think this works with CEOs, but actually it does seem to work for, for workers. Um, they match better workers to better firms. Um, and the result of that is, uh, is therefore worse, so-called worse workers to worse firms. And the result of that is because of this marginal product sort of log logic to which you refer to, there is an impact on inequality. Uh, you see it in this country, you see it in, in Germany as well. Uh, and that's partly the outcome of these heads reforms uh, as well. Um, and part of this is also the miracle obsession, if you wish, with what's called the competitiveness of Germany, mm -hmm. to make it as absolutely competitive as possible, not only vis-a-vis -vis Europe, but also primarily, I think, vis-a-vis -vis China and elsewhere, which is so, which is so, so, uh, so important. Now, you know a lot about this. I want you to, to, to teach me something about why this is not relevant to you, because uh, uh, I think it really is quite an important part of, this, of the underlying story. Now, for some crazy reason, I was at the, at the finance ministry in this last year when I spent in Berlin, as you, as you know. Uh, when I heard you talk so well with Klaus Ofer on your, on your, on your book. Um, and and I, I, I felt there was a different argument being made. It was the exact opposite of what the, the, the same argument as Whitbush made, but in reverse on this. And I think it's important to say this, is that, you know, the, when you have a too competitive Germany, which is the situation in, in, in Europe, you're going to get money flowing from the south to the north. You know? Since you can't get workers to flow from the south to the north, you can get money moved move that way. And you know this. Um, and this, is, of course, is a problem which was created by financial markets. It's created by financial markets, the overall crisis. But it's a problem which is sustained by German wage policy. And I think this is absolutely critical. It ultimately comes down to the wage policy in, in, in Germany. And what's even worse is the money flows into the real estate market. And you know the impact of real estate prices in Germany recently. And Germany has the lowest, one of the lowest rates of, of ownership of homes in Europe. So the distributional consequences are particularly extraordinary for the German, uh, for the German economy. Uh, so what Germany should be doing is weakening its competitiveness. It should be having a higher minimal, I said this in the finance industry, you can imagine the response. Um, <laughs> it, should have a, it should have minimal wages at the time, and it should have higher wages for the public sector. They should basically make themselves less competitive, higher wages, and reverse this very disastrous flow of capital from the south to the, uh, to the north itself. Uh, the problem is not, cap it's not capital markets. The problem is German labor policies, which is causing this particular issues and their solutions. Now, I won't talk about Soros too much on this, but I will say that Soros came up, as you know, with a very very interesting issue. I, I, I didn't review the Habermas debate, which I didn't read the time, but I did re review the Soros article, which again shows a certain, you know, predilection there. Which Soros said, as you know, what the, what the solution to the Euro is that the Germany should exit the Euro. Let's uh, call that a German Euro for the should be an immediate appreciation of the German euro, which would therefore would equilibrate German competitiveness closer to what it actually should be in this context. 
And the rest of Europe would have a non-German euro, which would be uh, depreciated, making them a lot more competitive. Um, so this and that actually makes perfect sense uh, on this, uh, if you think about it. Uh, and the rest of Europe is being dragged along by this high productivity, competitiveness obsession in Germany, <coughs> which is a tax on the rest of, the, uh, of, uh, of Europe. It's, I think the South has a lot of reason to be angry with Germany, leaving aside all the terrible things they say about, you know, about the Germans, as you bring up in the book, it is actually core to the, to the overall argument. I want to say something about Sweden uh, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, on this, um, and I was happy that Sweden adopted me as a citizen a few years ago, but that, that, that's not why I'm, I'm going I'm to you know, uh, bring it up. Um, um, not even for reasons of Swedish German football rivalry either, what I, I, I bring up. Um, but they were burned by the financial crisis you know in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and they seem to have learned from that pretty well. They bailed out the banks, they bailed out the, 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 Wallenberg, the, the Wallenberg family. Uh, so not, they, they themselves made the same sins which we certainly have, have made in this, in this country. Um, but they really did, over the past few decades, change themselves. And a lot of what they changed was through strengthening the market policies. They're much criticized by that, but it's actually a lot to be said for this. Um, and here I'm going to rely upon the work of uh, Jonas uh, Pontesson, who I know you respect very, uh, very much, uh, on the Swedish case. And, and what he says about them is that uh, the Swedish ideas of social citizenship strikes me as very, very powerful. Um, but the key outcome of, of, of the, the social citizenship, and here I'm almost, I'm, I'm quoting him directly, is to empower workers to become sellers of their labor power. Such an interesting expression, from sellers, because he's basically saying is that the market is a complement to those institutions which generate social justice. And I very rarely have seen any literature done on the varieties of capitalism, et cetera, any consideration of market as an institution being a complement to other institutions which can generate things which look like social justice uh, to us. The things he mentioned is the general public funds, which benefit social labor mobility. The penalties, uh, by having high wages, this is the only old uh, minor uh, policy, you actually would almost tax local activity industries firms, so you encourage workers to exit. Uh, so it's again through, through a combination of proactive uh, government policies, labor markets, our markets, you, you, would, uh, you would support this. And in addition, he talks about the issues of, of the educational system as well, which is incredible in terms of what they actually have, have achieved. Now, I had more to say. I'm looking at Josh's face. I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop on this, but I probably would like at some point, maybe afterwards during the cocktails uh, on this. Uh, Talk to you about yeah. Chattanooga, about Chattanooga and American unions on that, uh, and I'll leave a provocative, maybe tease in this whole thing, why uh, it's okay not to have unions uh, in the U.S. Uh, as long as you get other things such as workhouses along along the way. But, so, but, so, but we'll talk houses. workhouses. Okay. But we'll talk about those things maybe uh, privately. Thank you. So if you uh, writing a book is sort of exposing yourself to uh, uh, to uh, criticism. And afterwards, you feel exposed. You <laughs> uh, <laughs> shouldn't write books, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. And, and, and there is this general assumption that uh, knowledge is uh, sort of advanced by uh, critical dialogue. But if you are uh, the, the one uh, who is the subject of the critical dialogue, you might try to think about some better way of advancing <laughs> <laughs> knowledge. But uh, uh, actually, I think I've learned a lot from these comments. And uh, I will take them uh, one by one, begin with Adam. And uh, Adam's point was basically on the inflation angle. And then you uh, sort of elaborate this into some more general uh, uh, subject. Um, I, I lived through the 1970s as a left-wing social democrat mm -hmm. in Germany. And I thought that. Uh, it would, wouldn't it be nice if we had a little more inflation? Uh, because at the time, inflation was seen as a sort of backdoor redistributive device in, in favor of labor and uh, against those that own money and all sorts of things. Now, um, here, here's the issue of sustainability. 
I talk about, I talk not, I, I don't talk about this in terms of abstract technical sustainability of inflation in an economy. In the book, I talk about it in terms of political sustainability. The, the, there's two things that um, I remember very well from the, uh, or three things I remember from, from, from the discussion. First of all, John Goldthorpe, in, in, in discussing with this uh, character, I've, I've forgotten his name, who was a sort of uh, um, financial ti uh, times uh, uh, wizard. Samuel uh, Britton. Samuel Britton. Samuel Britton. And, and, and John says, I cannot imagine a capitalist society without inflation because uh, there is no normative consent on, on distribution. And if it's a capitalist economy, then the only possible outcome of an aggressive, organized labor uh, uh, working class is inflation. And I, I thought, yeah, okay, okay, that's. Uh, but then, three or four years later, inflation was completely gone in the whole system. Why? Because the American government had been taken over, or the American Central Bank had been taken over by forces that did not like to see the depletion of the money, uh, 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 the, the moneyed classes, so to speak, as a result of inflation. And in addition, when I later uh, sort of opened up to more uh, more, <laughs> more, more interpretations of the economy, uh, it, I'm, I'm impressed by this guy, Friedrich Hayek, uh, in, in many ways. Uh, I, I think the political conclusions uh, I hate, but, but in us, and Hayek has a wonderful piece, or several wonderful pieces, on the, on the fundamental problem of inflation as he describes it, which is the distortion of relative prices in an economy. Uh, and if the economy is open, it's also the migration of capital out of an inflationary economy. That turned into both a technical problem and a political problem. And you could see it. You could see it in, uh, in, in England, where I was often in the 1970s. Uh, where at the end of the 1970s there was total sort of chaos in industrial relations, uh, in, in economic policy, uh, uh, opening the door for minor Thatcher. Um, so the political and technical sustainability of this was a problem, especially in a world where you had different inflation rates in different countries. So you could have asked for the Germans to also have higher inflation and it might have been easy, but not forever. Because I think the Hayek argument about the distortion still, still would have applied. How does that relate to the concept of borrowing time? No, wait, wait, wait. Uh, in, in, in the following way, for governments uh, dealing with uh, unresolved distributional struggles, uh, uh, accommodating inflation can work for a time. It buys time. But uh, you get to a point where this medicine causes more damage than it does good. And then you have to have another fix. And the fix in the 1980s, after inflation rates had gone down everywhere in the world as a result of American action to 2-3%, was to destroy unions so that uh, uh, inflation would never return, and at the same time, let uh, government spending on, uh, on, on, on the social fallout, unemployment and all of this, go up because you couldn't reform the welfare state within a matter of a year. But as Stockman in his memoirs uh, makes clear, as these deficits uh, go up and up, the moment will come when you can now <coughs> attack the social welfare state uh, because you can blame it for the deficit, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. That's the second sort of buying time and running out uh, of steam for this. And then you had to have another trick, which was financialization. Uh, and now, after 2008, you have to, there's still, I, in the book it's not yet clear because I didn't know this. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't sort of Mario Draghi. Uh, but now you use the balance sheets uh, of central banks. And there again, I say, you can't do this forever. The, 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 the Bank for International Settlements in, in, uh, in, in Basel, basically the central bank of the central banks, is pretty clear on this. You can't do this forever. What else? Yeah, I don't know. I, you're the expert. But, but in, in my world, 
these things are uh, sort of uh, limited in use. Yeah? Uh, it, it, any any uh, line that goes straight up makes me nervous. Uh, because things just cannot go up. So that's my point about not, not to send. It's not a German obsession with, uh, with, uh, with stability. And in fact, in recent years, I've learned more about this. And <laughs> I'm quite willing to, uh, to, to say that if we can, uh, we can heal uh, conflict besides or do something for those that need it, and, and, and as a uh, price for this, uh, the dollar will in 20 years just buy, uh, one dollar will just buy what? I, I don't know, nothing anymore. Fine. For me, fine. But then something else comes in, uh, which is today. Yeah? When, when we, uh, when desperate, when I put, suddenly read that someone like uh, Larry Summers, Desperately, that asks for more inflation. That's interesting. Yeah? That's interesting, Be because now he sees the, the, the nightmare of, of deflation and especially debt deflation. Yeah. Now, now why? That, and, and then he says we can't get. I, my answer is the reason why we can't get it is you have destroyed the unions, who are the most likely uh, uh, agents. Uh, if you sort of spread money around to grab some of it, and as a result, sort of drive up prices. But unfortunately, they are no longer around. You have destroyed this. Then in addition, there are sort of technical problems with inflation today, which is the large number of people who are now uh, on fixed incomes uh, uh, in, in, in the social security system. So, so that's a big problem. You will get the pensioners all out in the street if you go to 5 6% inflation, which you need in order to wipe out the debt, I suppose, to, uh, for, for fiscal, fiscal uh, uh, re uh, repression. And then the final thing is, uh, Larry Summers again, right? Yeah, and also Krugman, they are of the, of the same view. Yes, let's have some, uh, so let's have money all, all over the place. If we can't get inflation, we will at least have a few bubbles once in a while. Yeah. Now, now these bubbles, I, I argue, are very dangerous. And, and they are not so dangerous to, to Lloyd Blankfield, they are dangerous to you and me, and, and to my, my poor grandmother. They're very dangerous. They explode in your face. So, so, uh, and 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 yes, we can't. Unfortunately, we can't predict bubbles anymore. But, and we don't even have the confidence that we can afterwards clear clear up, uh, clean, clean, clean the, the battlefield. So <coughs> that's my first one. Second, Katerina. Yeah, <laughs> this this women thing. Comes, comes, <laughs> comes back and back. And back. I, I have, I have written uh, an essay uh, on the strange uh, relationship between liberalization and liberation. I'm, I'm, I'm totally aware of this. But when I write the way I write, I look back at the time when uh, people at least were able to have the imagination or the fantasy to think about a world in which women would work 30 hours per week Men would work 30 hours per week, and life would be much better, and productivity would be uh, would be used to reduce work, rather than it's a dream. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rather than in our world, where people work and work and work, and they work ever more, and and working hours become ever longer, and 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 then it is quite clear that if you look at the migration of the women were the last category of people who migrated from the village to the city. So to speak. Yeah? And that takes place in the 19th century. And, and the, the, the migration from the village to the city is a great thing for people because the village is boring. And, 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 and. But in the city, you need politics that protect you from the uncertainties of life away from the village. And uh, uh, what, what employers have sort of managed in the 1970s was to use the excess supply of labor to increase competition in the labor market and to deregulate labor market. And there I say in this, <laughs> this particular passage that they often had the active support of women in this thing. And it was true. And it was true, partly because unions were organized in such a way that they couldn't represent them. 
but the point is a more general one, is sort of the homogeneity. Yeah. Right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and, and the, but 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 in the book where, where this thing comes up, I have to explain why uh, crisis theorists in the 1970s were wrong with respect to the attraction of markets and labor markets and capitalism for people. And there I say, uh, the first group that was uh, sort of enthralled with this was women, and the second then was in, in, right? So, so uh, in, in whenever you have an unlimited labor supply or you have a huge push into the labor market, it's very hard to regulate that. No, that's my, that also to, uh, uh, to, to go to. Um, Paternalism, nature of the beast. Yeah, um, there I think I have to do some uh, sort of additional, <laughs> additional work. Um, the, in provisional way, what you're discussing is the, the, the tension between agency and emergence. Right? Emergence is the unanticipated uh, collective consequence of what dispersed people do, and they can't control it, and it can blow up in their face. Uh, agency, in my book, is the activity of capital, quote unquote, this is a <laughs> short book, so uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to convince, force, constrain, uh, push governments to let them loose. So you can have agency with respect to the political system in favor of a free market that unfortunately afterwards uh, results in the emergence of things that you never expected. And this is the way I think I put the two things, I, I, I put the two things together. Um, democratic dilemma, uh, Italy, uh, the, the nation state, uh, I think I can agree with everything you say uh, it, adding to this, however, that uh, 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 the, the nations as they are constituted today are complicated enough. If you, uh, if you create a political entity that incorporates even more complexity and even more diversity, the problems of governability will increase even beyond what you now observe in a country like Italy with, with strong uh, regional disparities. That's my point in the last uh, part of the book. And uh, um, devaluation, my God, I, I really don't know what competitive devaluation can do. Uh, but whenever a German sort of argues against, uh, uh, against devaluation, I get uh, suspicious in, because we benefit from the fact that these people cannot devalue against us. In the same way as I get suspicious when I hear George Soros s uh, suggest anything, be because, <laughs> because I don't know where his money is, right? right. <laughs> and, 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 and how, he, how he expects to benefit from his advice. <laughs> uh, so, no, this is, uh, uh, the, the Germans, the Germans, the, the, that's my point in the last part. And, and okay, okay, here, here comes. Um, the last part is not a policy subject because I do not, no longer think that uh, we can sort of make these suggestions. I think the Europeans will stick to the euro the way they are. Now, that, uh, then I have a very pessimistic uh, uh, perspective based on this uh, thing. We will have enormous internal conflict within Euroland over uh, inter-regional redistribution. Um, the market works its way which means that the Germans will do it well, the Finns will do it well, and the others will relatively uh, sort of lose against them. So you have to do something. Then you get this uh, sort of devil's circle, uh, which is this. They claim European solidarity. The Dutch and the German and the Finnish electorate will say, oh, a little bit of solidarity is fine, but, but not so much. And in return, we want to say as to how you use the money. So then we will have a conflict about transfers on the one hand, transfers of money on the one hand, and transfers of sovereignty on the other hand. That's totally explosive. Because the southern countries will, will always think that uh, the money is not enough, and the, and the sovereignty demanded is too much. And the, in, in the inverse, uh, 
the, the northern electorates will think they want too much money and they don't give us too much, uh, give, give us enough of, of, a, of a say in the region. Don't we see this in the relationship between northern Italy and, 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 and southern Italy? And this is a country that has been united for 150 years and they have a common football team. Yeah? They have a common football team of which they are proud. The Finns and the, and, and the, and the Greeks have no common football team. Uh, so, so where's the solution? The solution is an enormously long-drawn uh, uh, conflict. And, and if I think about the euro as, as something that was supposed to bring Europe together, and now I see it as a, as a thing that drives European uh, people uh, apart. That is really very, very depressing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, now Bruce and I, uh, I don't want to go too long. Yes, we can give uh, a last I, remark and then we'll, I leave leave Sweden, we'll give everyone a drink. I leave Sweden <laughs> alone. I, I, I leave Sweden aside. I, I have a very different story than, than Jonas on Sweden. We have done a lot of Sweden research in, in Cologne in recent years. <coughs> To my great surprise, now the number of, uh, of students' uh, uh, secondary education in private schools in Sweden exceeds any other, yeah. country, any other, any other country. And, and uh, the push towards uh, privatization is enormous. The, uh, the basic uh, level of unemployment moves between 6 and, and, and 8 percent. For Sweden, completely unimaginable uh, 20 years ago. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, 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 the taxation level in Sweden is going down dramatically. Yeah. So no, I have, uh, uh, I, I, I don't see, the, see Jonas, he lives in this, in this capitalist uh, uh, nirvana, which is the, the worker becomes an owner of human capital, which he or she sells in the market. Right? This is not new, this is not a new thing, uh, and, and it has never worked. Okay, uh, one more thing on, on Germany. Uh, the Schröder line there is tongue in cheek. So th this is not, uh, I, I personally think that these Schröder reforms, uh, they, no, I, I must say since, since, since you asked this, uh, when I uh, worked for the Chancellery between 1998 and 2000, one of the things that I thought we needed immediately was a, le was a, was a, was a minimum wage, a statutory minimum wage. And that's why, that was one reason, that was another reason why I could no longer continue, because that was totally anathema, not just to the government, but to the, to the, to the employers also, but to the trade unions as well, mm. because they believed in negotiating mm. things. Yeah? Um, and, and then my final point, and then I stop here, my final, why don't the Germans weaken their own competitiveness? <laughs> Uh, in, in order to salvage Europe or, or what, 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 to live a better life and so on. We mm. live in capitalism. In capitalism, it is not the Germans that uh, make these decisions, but German firms. And German firms have German workers. And unfortunately, or fortunately, presently fortunately, this is an industrialized economy. If it was a service economy, it was different for the following reason. If the competitiveness of a um, <coughs> Uh, of, of a sector that is an export sector, industrial export sector. If that competitiveness declines, it is not just that you uh, have higher wages. Uh, you have higher wages for the remaining workforce. And, and the other workforce is in Hungary or, in, or, or wherever else. And that's something that we did research on in the early 2000s. This, uh, this wave of uh, relocations of production to other countries, which, uh, which leads to the union being extremely uh, shy about uh, a wage increase because they know that a wage increase here would result in uh, relocation of production. That was different in the 1980s when we had sort of captive capitalism. capitalism. They are no longer captive, they can go. And as a result of this, and so the, the prosperity of the German economy, also of the social security system because we have a high level of employment as a result of our, our Com com competitiveness in the international market. If that goes, then we have not just uh, an employment crisis, we also have the classical terms of crisis of, of the fiscal, uh, the, 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 the social security issue. Uh, it's not so easy. And, and now I have a final sentence. The, the I have, before I wrote this book, I wrote a book with, with the title Reforming Capitalism, with a hyphen between re and forming. 
and that was on the social, uh, on the institutional transformation of the German economy since the 19, 1990. What I saw there, in a country that supposedly was the last stronghold of uh, social uh, uh, capitalism uh, and, and, and so on, told me that we were in a liberalization, not as a loop, but I, I call it a, uh, uh, it's a slippery slope. And, and then, looking at these things, I thought, whew, uh, it's not just Germany. 